everybody, Eve Harrow on Rejuvenation for the Land of Israel Network. Um, I'm taping this on a really crazy morning. It's Thursday, actually it's afternoon already. Thursday, April 11th, 2019. Beautiful day in Israel. But we're right at this point where we're not sure what's going on with the elections and voting could go either way for the, for the new right. So I don't even really want to talk about it because um, anything can change and probably will in the next few hours. Um, but very excited about the moon landing that is supposed to be in just a few hours. And that's, of course, the joke that's running around Israel right now that we can send a spaceship to the moon, but we can't seem to do simple math when it comes to counting votes. So fortunately, our sense of humor saves us um, when we otherwise could wonder what on earth is going on. But I am sitting in Jerusalem with Mati Friedman uh, in the middle of his new book, Spies of No Country. So first of all, Mati, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me on the show. So last night, you had a book reading here in Jerusalem, sold out. I I'm no, Almost no exaggeration, people were scalping tickets on the street to get in. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, how, how many people showed up and look, what kind of audience was it? I guess about 250 people showed up, uh, English speakers. This was um, a launch for the English version of the book. The Hebrew version will be out in about, I guess, five or six months. So it was a great crowd. People seemed very interested in this story. And um, yeah, it was, a great, it was a great evening. All right, so tell us a little bit about this particular book. You've written other books also that I'd also like to talk, ask you about in a few minutes in case people have not heard of you. I highly recommend they go, they go back into all your books. But, um, but Spies of No Country, Secret Lives at the Birth of Israel. So what compelled you to write this book? It's, it's, not, like, it's not really a historical book. You're focusing on four individuals who were, what they did was critical right around 47, 48, 49, right when we needed it. Right. So this book looks at four very young um, men who come to Israel from the Arab world. They're Jews from Arab countries. They end up in Israel in the 1940s and are recruited by an early incarnation of Israeli intelligence. It was an operation called the Arab Section, which was a very small, very amateurish kind of ad hoc uh, intelligence unit. And what they were looking for was people who could pass on the other side of the line, people who could assume Arab identities, people who had native Arabic. And these um, these four spies who were part of a section that was never much more than a dozen uh, agents all told, ended up being one of the seeds of what eventually became the Mossad. So their adventures around 1948 and around the War of Independence say something I think really new about that war and also offer us a glimpse at how Israel's intelligence services get founded. So one of the things that I find challenging when I guide people around Israel of today in 2019 is they're seeing an incredible country, modern country, superpower in so many ways. You know, people, there's enough food here for people for the most part. Distribution is something else. But saying it's a completely different country. And then, like I read Ronan Bergman's book on the Mossad. So you have a glimpse into what it is today by all standards, one of the you know agencies in the world. But what you're doing is going back to the very, very beginning. And what I so appreciated about that is really to understand the process of what happens here, not to take anything for granted. So, but what did you, like, what kicked you off on this? What was in your head that, that you decided, let's go back to the very beginning, to these crazy, crazy times when Israel might not have been born and there's certain individuals who make all the difference. Right. So one thing that um, that's hard to do, I think, in this story is forget everything that's happened since 1948. So you have to imagine what existed here in 1946, 1947. There is no state of Israel. There is no Mossad. There is no Israeli army. It's unclear that any of this is actually going to happen. In retrospect, it seems obvious that events are going to go the way we know that they went. But these guys didn't know. And when they begin their intelligence uh, careers in 1945, 6, 7, there's no guarantee that there's going to be a state. And actually, when they leave on their first mission into the Arab world, which is in the spring of 1948, there is no state of Israel. And it looks very iffy. Uh, the question of whether the state is actually going to be founded and, and whether it will be able to survive is an open is an open question. So it is possible when they leave for the Arab world that they won't have anywhere to come back to. And that uh, that mental space is hard to inhabit from 2019 when it's obvious to us that we're in you know we're sitting in Jerusalem and the country is doing well in many ways. Um, but that was not their state of mind. It was so chaotic and so. Um, unpredictable. And we have to kind of remember what it was like if we really want to appreciate who these guys were and what kind of risks they were taking at that time. These are the years between the end of World War II 
1948, which turns out to be the birth of Israel. But like you said, we didn't know. So the British are still here. We're still under the mandate. Uh, everybody is still recovering or not recovering from World War II. There is still a, there's a very strong German-Arab tie, which is also not necessarily uh, understood Okay, the Germans weren't in love with the Arabs, but they kind of, I guess, met on their hatred of Jews. So when the how did these guys come here? Because now when you come to Israel, and I'm not sure everybody knows this, and it's why I'm going to repeat it all the time. When you come to Israel, you realize this is a Middle Eastern country. Over half of the people living in Israel come from the Middle East. But in the late 1940s, the Arab world has not yet thrown out most of their Jews. So these guys are unusual. You still, what, who do you have here at the time? Who, who's the, what's the majority of the Jewish population looking like here? Survivors who finally made it in, the locals who've been here, I mean, some Jews have been here, you know, for hundreds of years. So are they also standing out in, in the sense of the Jewish population? Sure. In the 1940s, nine out of every 10 Jews here come from Europe, mostly Eastern Europe. And the the um, Middle Eastern uh, se segment of the Jewish population is very small. So when these guys begin their, their careers, they're quite exotic. Um, and they're definitely a small minority. And that makes them very valuable. Uh, Jews who come from the Arab world are treated with um, disdain in many cases, and they're kind of pushed to the margins. And so, so are these guys, and they tell their stories, uh, the stories of their first years in, in the country. One of them, for example, Gamli El Cohen uh, from Damascus. He's a young guy. These guys are all very young. They're barely out of their teens when this starts. Some of them are kind of street kids. They're really marginal, um, kind of people living here without parents and kind of making it work somehow. Uh, Gamliel, uh, who is born with the name Jamil Cohen, that's his name. He grows up with the name Jamil, ends up on a kibbutz and he wants to be a pioneer. And he finds that the society on the kibbutz isn't willing to accept him uh, easily because he's so different from them. He doesn't come from the world of Yiddish and he doesn't come from the world of Eastern Europe. And he comes from next door. He's from Damascus and he speaks native Arabic and he looks Arab and he has an Arabic accent in his Hebrew. And all of this makes it very hard for him to assimilate into the kibbutz society. Um, and he remembers being treated with condescension. And then as he's trying to break into the society, a recruiter arrives from the Arab section, which is this very early intelligence unit that's part of the Palmach, which is kind of the holy of holies of the Zionist movement. It's this radical socialist militia that plays a key role in the founding of the state. And this recruiter shows up on the kibbutz and spots Gamli al Cohen, but he doesn't want Gamli al Cohen. He wants Jamil Cohen. He wants his earlier Arab identity because that's what the intelligence services need. They need people who can go back into the Arab world and pass. So he's taken to the Arab section. He's taken out of the kibbutz and is uh, taken. He's selected because of the characteristic that he was trying to erase. He was trying not to be like an Arab, but the intelligence services need him to be as much like an Arab as possible. Uh, and he is taken to the Arab section where he assumes a third identity, which is the identity of Yusuf al Hamid, who's a Palestinian Muslim. And that's the identity under which he operates uh, in the years of the Arab section. So uh, that, I think, illustrates something of the complications that these guys were, were living with at that time. The, the characteristic that was making their lives difficult ended up being their ticket in to the Zionist movement and into the most important part of the Zionist movement, which was the Palmach. Uh, after 1948, of course, that whole world, the world of Jews in Arab countries collapses. And there are about a million Jews native to the Islamic world in the 1940s. Baghdad in the 1940s is about one third Jewish. And that all collapses within a few years of the 48 war. And then there's a wave of immigration into the state that changes the DNA of the state because the founders of Israel never paid a thought to the Jews of the Middle East, that wasn't who the state was designed for. It was designed to save the Jews of Europe, but it didn't. It was founded too late. And the Jews of Europe, with the exception of a small remnant, are gone by the end of the war. And instead, the Jews of the Middle East show up and end up changing what the society is. And they inform every aspect of the society. The religion in Israel is very Middle Eastern. Our politics are very Middle Eastern. Pop music, cuisine, behavior, you know. Eh. So without understanding that, I think no one is going to get very far in understanding Israel in 2019. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think, we're, I mean, we're seeing this and it's still, the process is still in the middle. I mean, we're, you know, the elections and all the results and 
what some people are saying about what Israel is like. And I know the difficulty that I have in explaining to people why they don't understand Israel, be it Christians or be it Jews, because this is a Middle Eastern country. And I think you're seeing it also reflected in the young people. Um, I mean, you know, talk, I talk about this. We talked about it before I opened the mic in terms of the religious aspect of the country is also more. It's not that people are becoming more religious. It's that because I can say like around my own house, I have seven kids who based on the way they would grow up, some of them are much less religious than I raised them. It's a different kind of Judaism. It's a Middle Eastern Judaism. It's family oriented. It's, you know, the prayers, but you don't necessarily say them. And I would say, though, that it's very much one of faith, all right? It may not be crossing all your T's and dotting all your I's, but it's one where there's a real sense of faith of a bigger picture here. And perhaps that's the difference also between what you have in the West necessarily and what you have in the East. Were, the, were these guys like that? Like, did they come from, because one of the issues that you talk about, you know, Arab is a culture, so they might have fit in with the Arab culture, but they've got to now learn to be Muslims, and the nuances of that, they didn't know how to pray as Muslims. So how does all that fit in? Do they have to like shunt their Jewish part aside in order to make this happen? They, I think, found the religious um, approach uh, in pre-state uh, Israel very confusing because if you come from an Arab city, um, if you're a Jewish kid who grows up in a Jewish community in a place like Aleppo or Syria, there is no secularism. There's no option of not being religious. Now, you don't have to be completely stringent, but uh, no one is secular. And there's no secularism really in the Arab world at that time. Muslims aren't secular and Jews aren't secular. That's just not an option. You live inside a religious community and then you navigate tradition, but there's no way out really of the of the community. And they arrive on, on the Kibbutzim, which are kind of militantly secular, and they're very Jewish, and they speak Hebrew, and these guys know Hebrew because that's the language that they speak in synagogue, but these uh, people on the Kibbutzim don't have rabbis, and there's no synagogue on the Kibbutz, and they're not, um, in many ways, they're opposed to uh, to Jewish law and, and Jewish tradition, and they find it quite confusing. And you can see it in some of their letters at the time. Gamliel, for example, writes a letter in the 40s where he's trying to understand what's what the story is with this, uh, with the Kibbutznikim, who, are, who he loves in many ways, but he just can't understand uh, their approach to Judaism and, and their approach to Zionism. They think that Zionism is a secular idea when it's clear to Gamliel that it's a religious idea. Like you say every day in synagogue, May our eyes see your return to Zion in mercy. So he thought that was Zionism. It was just a Jewish idea that they always had. Of course, all the Jews in Damascus, which is where he was from, they knew that eventually you go back to the land of Israel. That's That was always the plan, even though even if they didn't really think it was about going to happen right then. Um, so he couldn't understand why the, the Kibbutz Nikim thought that Zionism was a secular idea and they and they navigated this this stuff in those years along with everything else that they had to navigate and more than 70 years later this is still one of the issues i mean again you could see from the election results that that kibbutz socialist even though it's not really so socialist anymore idea of this just being a secular jewish state is really on its way out now after many many decades of, of israel changing so these guys they have no parents and they're young they're on their own they're so poor i mean you read the book Ending the day with something to eat was not a given. Um, did the the establishment or whatever passes for establishment at the time, this Arab unit, in any way help them with that? Did they give them some kind of stipend? Uh, no, they weren't making any salaries. At the time, you know, if you were in the Palmach, you were in it for ideals and people were giving everything they had for for nothing. And it's quite amazing when you understand what they were working with. So this is the origins of Israeli intelligence. Uh, at the beginning of the, the the section's activities, they don't have a camera. They don't own a camera. So when they need a camera, they have to borrow one from some guy who they knew who had a Minox. And they were once told that uh, they took the camera on a mission to the Syrian border. And they were told that if they didn't come back, that was okay. But, they, but nothing could happen to this camera. Uh, they didn't have a camera when they get sent into the Arab world in April 1948. They don't have a radio. So there's no way to communicate. They're just sent and they're supposed to figure it out. Uh, they have nothing and they make it work nonetheless. And that's one of the most amazing things about this uh, about this story. The fact that any of them came back alive is quite miraculous. Of about a dozen agents in the section at the beginning of the 48 war, half of them are caught and executed in large part because they didn't really know what they were doing. There was no spy school. They weren't properly equipped. All they had was um, 
a lot of smarts and a lot of dedication and desperation, which was what was driving the Jewish national movement at the time. They had no other choice. And that kept them going. So what were they sent into the Arab world to do? And you Because know, there were plenty of things happening here in, in Israel, Palestine at the time. What, what were they supposed to be doing out in, let's say, Lebanon or Beirut and, and Damascus and some of the places that they were sent? So the section's activities and, and this book uh, uh, begins in inside the borders of British Mandate Palestine. They start out by collecting intelligence. So they would go into Arab towns dressed as itinerant peddlers, for example, and they would collect information. They would speak to people. They'd try to understand you know, who the powers are in each village, what they were planning as the war heated up. Uh, they graduated eventually to sabotage. They carried out a sabotage operation in Haifa, which is a mixed Jewish-Arab city in the beginning of 1948. Then they graduate to an assassination attempt. They, uh, they're sent to kill one of the Arab military leaders in Haifa. And then in April 1948, they're dispatched out of the borders of British Mandate Palestine right before the declaration of the state and end up in Lebanon. And in Lebanon, in Beirut, they're supposed to be collecting intelligence. They're supposed to understand what the mood is on the Arab street, what is happening with the Palestinian refugees, what the Arab military preparations are, what the odds are for a renewed offensive. And in Lebanon as well, they also carry out some sabotage, not as much as they wanted, but because they really wanted to blow a lot of things up and they weren't allowed to most of the time. But, uh, but they are sent, for example, to blow up uh, a yacht that had formerly belonged to Adolf Hitler, which showed up in the port of Beirut in the fall of 1948, a small warship, an armed uh, yacht that was built by the Nazis in the 30s. And it ends up in Beirut. It shows up there quite unexpectedly. And these guys are sent to blow it up. So they are uh, they are used for sabotage as well. And that uh, that continues until the spring of 1950, which is when the Arab section is recalled and they're brought back to Israel, those who survived. And um, when they come back to Israel in the spring of 1950, it's the first time they've ever been there because when they left, there was no state. So their first time in the state of Israel is in 1950, and it's the last section of the Palmach that's dismantled. Because the Palmach, which is this militia, very important militia, is dismantled in 1948 as part of the formation of the Israel Defense Forces. But one part of the Palmach was never dismantled because they weren't in Israel. They were in Beirut. So they come back in 1950. That is the last section of the Palmach to go. And that, in many ways, is really the beginning of Israeli intelligence, the beginning of kind of an organized military and intelligence service that replaces this very chaotic uh, uh, world of, of, of militias that existed before the founding of the state. Who, who do you actually interview? I mean, here we are. It's 2019 when the book is coming out. We're talking about events that happened well over 70 years ago. There's a time factor here. Even though these guys were young, you know, the decades have passed. And it makes me think to myself, why didn't somebody write this story down in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s? You could have had at least, if not more of the guys themselves, more people who were around during that time. Now, to, you know, the decades have done what they have done. So who did you actually go to to get the story? I met the only one of my four characters who's still alive, who is Isaac Shoshan. And I happened to meet him through another spy who I'd met. And um, I was introduced to him in 2011. And I ran to interview him. And he told me the story about 1948 that really blew my mind. I'd never heard anything like it. And I'd never heard of the Arab section uh, or any of his comrades. And I'd never heard of any of the adventures that they had. And um, I said, wow, this is quite a story. And I ran to spend as much time with him as I could. And I uh, interviewed him many times and recorded it. And then over a period of, of years, it didn't happen in a straight line, but I uh, found other oral testimonies that had been left behind by other members of the Arab section. And I went to the military archive and got files declassified because it turned out that the Arab section files were still secret 70 years later. And they declassified some of them, a lot of them. And all of that uh, allowed me to write this book. Spies of they declassified them based on your request? Yeah, no, that's right. That's wow. right. The files had never been declassified before. For example, radio traffic between headquarters in Israel and this very kind of amateur operation in Beirut. Um, it's just handwritten kind of transcripts of radio messages going back and forth. So those were those files had not been declassified until now. And um, I got to see them and it's quite amazing. Also, when you realize what what this operation was. I mean, the the Israeli intelligence station in Beirut was this one room apartment on a rooftop with a Morse transmitter and uh, an antenna that was disguised as a clothesline. That was all it was. And they were just tapping messages back and forth and we have the messages, so. Did these guys end up uh, like telling their story to their children? Yes, yes, absolutely. And in, the, in these families, the story is very much alive 
I got to meet some of the children of the spies and for them, and this was a big part of growing up. And I think many of them felt that they're, that, that these spies never got the recognition that was due to them, uh, which is true. They didn't. Uh, there was one book that was written about this unit in the 1980s by a historian named Tzvi Kandro. It came out in Hebrew. It was never translated and it's out of print. Gamliel Cohen, who's one of my four, wrote him, he, he himself wrote a book that came out in 2001, also in Hebrew and also uh, never translated and also out of print and hard to find. So this the story never penetrated the consciousness of anyone really. I mean, certainly not known outside of Israel and even inside Israel. Um, most people have never heard of the Arab section, unfortunately. I mean, I think it's undeniable that we were treated to treated. We were given a very skewed version of history of what happened here in the 1940s and 50s. Ben Gurion and the Yishuv, amazing people, amazing leaders for their time. I will not take anything away from them in, in what they did. But they write down the history from a very Ashkenazi, from a very, if you will, Mapai Labor Party perspective. Um, that's why people... The Begin people, the revisionists, the Yergun people, a lot of them left Israel in the 1950s because if you weren't in with the Branja, with the elite, you couldn't get a job if you weren't with the Histadrut, which was the union. My own father grows up here in the 30s and 40s. They're refugees from Germany. They end up leaving for different reasons as well. But if you weren't part of this core group and you had those connections, there was really no place for you in Israel. And I think that that's what happened with a lot of the Jews from the Middle East as well. I mean, they coming here and really being treated for a long time as second-class citizens. And then, of course, the children learning the history just reinforced that idea. Right. Uh, if you look at the Syrian community, for example, so Isaac's from Aleppo, and Aleppo has an ancient Jewish community, and um, a lot of them come here after Aleppo falls apart, and there's a pogrom in 1947, and uh, a lot of them pass through here and don't stay, and the, the Aleppo Jewish community is one of the great Jewish communities, incredibly kind of cohesive and successful community, and they, they pass through here, and they see what the country is, and it's a Jewish country, and they appreciate that, but it's socialist. They don't want anything to do with socialism. Um, and it's Ashkenazi. It's run by European Jews who have a very low opinion of Jews from the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And the Aleppo Jews think that they are kind of, kind of, uh, maybe a kind of uh, royalty or the flagship community of, of the Middle East in many ways. And they don't like being uh, uh, condescended to, understandably. So they continue and they end up, many of them, in Brooklyn, in mm -hmm. Flatbush. Deal, New Jersey. And in Deal, New Jersey, where you can see that it's one of the most successful communities in the Jewish world. They have incredible talents in, um, in many fields, particularly in the field of, of business. And Israel ends up losing these people because of the, uh, the unfortunate approach of, of the people running the show at the time. And in, in the defense of the Zionist um, establishment at the time, you know, nice, sensitive, considerate people do not create countries. So if you want to create a country, you need some very committed people with a very clear ideology about what they're doing. And that's why we have this country, because of David Ben-Gurion and Chaim Weizmann and Golda Meir and those people who create the country. And they're not, you know, they're not soft around the edges. They know what they're doing. They have a very clear idea. And I think that we all need to appreciate them very much. Uh, it wasn't going to happen with uh, with no flaws. But I think that now in 2019, we can acknowledge the black the, the blind spots uh, that they had and the Jews of the Middle East were one of the main blind spots. Are you considered like a post-Zionist writer? Because some of the people over the years who have kind of gone into some of these archives and said, whoa, I mean, you look at Benny Morris and maybe he's, he's attacked or lauded depending on where you sit. And I actually do both. I think a lot of his stuff is very valuable, what he has said, but timing is also everything. But they go into some of the archives of the war and say different things that we did and shouldn't have done. Um, it, are you put in that camp because you are now exposing something that wasn't exposed or because you're doing it in a different way? You're not a historian in the sense of, let's say, a Benny Morris where you're just doing facts. You're doing it through stories of people. So so where do you, where do you see yourself and where have, do other people see you in this whole thing? Well, I think that in 2019, the country is mature enough and kind of secure enough that we can now talk about uh, things with more openness. And I think the country was very defensive in its first decades and um, maybe there was no other way to do it. But certainly now I think that we can, you know, uh, uh, talk about Everything. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, if it's the treatment of Jews from the Middle East, if it's what happened to the Palestinian Arabs in 1948. I mean, if we believe that this country had to happen, as I certainly believe, then we can you know, admit that there were flaws in the way it was done. And we could admit that harm was inflicted on other people. And there might have been nothing we can do about it. Right. But there, if you try to erase it, it means that your faith in the cause is weak. 
I think if your faith is strong, then you can accept that mm -hmm. um, reality is very complicated. So um, I'm certainly not, not a post-Zionist writer in any way. Um, uh, and, and my heroes in this book are very much part of the Zionist movement, and that's why I chose them. So one way of attacking this story would be to write a story of victimization of Jews from the Middle East, and you can write those stories, and many of them are true. Uh, the stories of the Ma'abarot, the refugee camps that were set up here, and stories of discrimination, and, and, and those stories are all, all true, but I didn't want to write that story. I wanted a story about Jews who came from the Middle East and were actors in the Zionist movement who played a role in the creation of the state. They weren't victims, these spies. They took their fate into their own hands and they set out to create a country for Jews, not just Jews from Europe, but for Jews from, from the Middle East. So the choice of these characters with all their complications and with all their criticism of, um, of the country at the time, um, the, the book is very much a book about the founding of, of the state um, and it's very much a book with Israeli heroes, Zionist heroes who are um, complicated. And I think in 2019, we can accept complicated heroes. And I think that maybe complicated heroes are the best heroes for 2019, the years of uh, of Exodus and uh, right. Ari ben Canaan. I mean, those, those years are gone, thank yeah. God. And I think we can uh, deal with things that are more more complex. So this is a a creation story about the state of Israel. It's kind of a love letter to heroes of the creation of the state of Israel, but it's also a complicated story, and I think we can handle it. And I think that's very Jewish because, uh, I mean, if you look in the Bible, there isn't one perfect person there. And that is a very huge message I think a lot of times people miss, especially people who are living in a more Christian-dominated world, even if they're not Christian themselves, where there's more of like sinners and, and, and saints we do not have that in Judaism. We have every single person with major flaws. And the, at least for me, and I would imagine maybe for you too, or for a lot of Israelis, is how do you get past yourself? How do you make yourself better than you were? And not necessarily a strive for perfection. And, and that comes across just so beautifully in the book. Um, but one, one of the things that I'm, that I'm getting out of the book, and I'm still in the middle of it, is how difficult this must have been in their own heads. And maybe that's spies in general when you're living a double life at some point do you forget who you really are i think that it takes a real toll on them yes and they're they're, they're there for years it's not like they went in for a couple of weeks and came out they're living for years as palestinian refugees with with palestinian refugees and they um they're sympathetic to the other side. They're, they never waver in their allegiance to the Zionist movement, but they're definitely very humane observers of the other side. And Gamliel, one of the spies, says at some point that he, after a while, he wasn't faking it. His, his identity was real. And it's important to remember that their Arab identities were in large part real. They hadn't been taught to be Arabs. They really were. They were from Damascus and Aleppo. Their native language was Arabic. Arab culture was their native culture. They were from the Arab world. So when they get sent as spies into that world, they're going back to the place that they're from and their connections to uh, Muslims in the Arab world is very strong. In some ways, it's stronger than their connection to European Jews. Mm -hmm. They have a, more in common culturally, perhaps, with the Muslims among whom they're living than they would with a German you know, shopkeeper from Tel Aviv, for right. example. So their place in all this is, uh, is, is blurry. But at the same time, they're completely committed to the creation of a state, they're completely committed to the Palmach. They know that the Jews need a state. And they also understand that the price that the Jews are going to pay for the state may be better than the Jews who came from Europe because they understand what the Islamic world is and they understand that you can't flip the hierarchy in the Islamic world and create a sovereign Jewish enclave in the middle of that world and expect everyone just to agree with it and forget and move on. They know in 1948 that it's not going to work that way. Mm -hmm. and, and you also make it so clear how sometimes things hinged on a little nuance. You know, because they might have been Arab in culture, but they weren't Muslims. And so not knowing how to say, wash their feet properly before they went into a mosque or little, little things like that, that a born from Muslim would know, sometimes made all the difference in life and death. That's right. Um, they uh, could get killed, for example, if they conjugated a verb wrong and someone noticed, or if they made a mistake in their accent in the Arab world. Um, Accent and dialect is very important, and it varies from village to village and from sect to sect. So if you're you know, claiming to be from Jerusalem, but you speak with the accent of someone from, uh, from the Galilee, for example, someone could notice, and it could get you killed. Mm -hmm. uh, one, um, in one incident, the first two agents who are caught and executed, one thing that seems to have tripped them up is that um, they didn't know how to wash their face 
um, before praying in the way that almost any Muslim would know. Mm -hmm. There's a ritual purification called wudu that you have to carry out before you pray. And when they draw suspicion in Jaffa, right at the beginning of the 1948 war, the Arab militiamen who capture them don't know what to do with them because these guys speak perfect Arabic and they seem like Arabs, but they, they're suspicious. So they say, okay, wash your face as you would wash your face before prayer. And one of them can't. And that seems to be one thing that ends with them both being shot in the dunes outside Jaffa. And it happens in a few other cases as well. So the distance between life and death was um, inches. So I imagine this is also why, jumping to now, the Mossad is maybe more successful than other Western intelligence units because so many of the people, I would imagine, that belong to the Mossad, if they grew up, let's say, in Arabic-speaking homes or here in the Middle East, be much harder to cover or to infiltrate into the Arab world if you're coming from England or coming from the United States or coming from Sweden, then it would be also in terms of what people look like here. This is not a white country. And people here look like Middle Easterners in many ways. And you can't change, Michael Jackson excluded, of course, you can't change your skin color and you can't change the way you look. So you think that's also part of the success of the Mossad today is that Middle Eastern basis? That's certainly true of the Mossad in its first decades. Uh, one of the great secrets of the success of the Mossad is that they have this incredible reservoir of people who can pass for Arabs. And that's mm -hmm. a, very handy if you're at war with the Arab world. So in the first decades of the state, that's certainly, that's certainly true. But the, it's kind of ironic. But the Zionist movement always is, is always intent on erasing the double identity of the Jews. So you're not supposed to be a Polish Jew or a Hungarian Jew, or a Russian Jew, or an Arab Jew, or you're supposed to be just an Israeli. So you're not supposed to speak more than one language. The language you're supposed to speak is Hebrew, and the, and speaking other languages is discouraged very aggressively in the, in the early years of the state, particularly Arabic. No one wants to speak Arabic. We're at war with the Arab world, and being an Arab is not desirable, and speaking Arabic isn't desirable. Arabic music is kept off the radio, for example, and Arabic culture is kind of scorned. Um, and that means that the children of this generation of spies, the, the children don't speak Arabic and they've lost the ability to pass in the Arab world. So today when the intelligence services look for recruits, they don't have that reservoir of people because, you know, second generation, third generation, they're Israelis. There's a trickle of Jews coming here from countries like Morocco, but mm -hmm. it's so, um, or Iran, but it's so small that it's, um, you know, it's, it's negligible now. So that was definitely an advantage in the first decades of the state, but it's an advantage that we've lost, ironically, because the Zionist movement has been so successful and they've created a country of Israelis, which is maybe good in some ways, but it's very bad for the intelligence services. I think it's bad in general. I, I wish that, I mean, I came here too late and I'm not great with languages, but I wish that my kids had all learned Arabic, and not just to become spies, but because you live in the Middle East and we should be able to communicate even not on a great level, with the people around us. Uh, just like English is the lingua franca, if you go out, I, I, I think it's really one of the things that still needs to be done here is that Arabic should become a, a, a given language, Arabic, English, and Hebrew. I'm not talking ideologically, it does, as you said, we need to be secure enough to know that we can speak Arabic and still have Israel as a Jewish country. It's not going to take away, if anything, I think you get more respect from somebody when you speak to them in their language. Yeah, I think that's true. Uh, and I think that it might be understandable why people had a kind of, um, um, they were kind of repelled by the Arab world, which was at war with Israelis. And, and Israelis had been killed in, you know, by the thousands in the war with the Arab world in 1948. And then again, and all the other um, uh, wars that came afterwards. So people weren't, you know, running to embrace culture of people who are trying to eradicate the country where they where they live but um if we understand that arabic is actually the native language of a big chunk of the country and that arabic in many ways is a jewish language uh, maimonides the greatest jewish mind in the last two thousand years he wrote in arabic and as did many jewish scholars and that was always kind of repressed the arabness of the jews was always repressed because it wasn't what we wanted to be we wanted to be western we wanted to be european and that's unfortunate and i think that now you see in israel people going back to it so the you know the grandchildren of that generation of immigrants some of them are singing in arabic now mm -hmm. uh, there's a singer named dudu tassa who's an israeli rocker kind of a mainstream rocker but he's the grandson of one of the most famous musicians from iraq uh, his grandfather and his grandfather's brothers, brother, uh, the El Kuwaiti brothers, were very famous musicians in Iraq. And Dudu Tassa, a few years ago, put out an album in Arabic of his 
of his grandfather's music and um, other Rita and Israeli pop singers put out an, angu- an album in uh, Persian, which is her family's language. And that's happening a lot. So there is a return to the roots, mm-hmm. but it's coming after a generation or two of, um, of an erasure of that culture. Right. Yeah, Actually, that's on a short list for a, for a show of mine is the music. You can tell so much about the culture from the music. And if you listen to Israeli music now, a lot of times you'll have verses of Tehillim, of Psalms, but set to a very particular Middle Eastern kind of a beat with with different kinds of instruments. And I think that's telling a lot about what's happening here in Israel. So do that in another show. But tell us a little bit about your other books. Uh, My first book is called The Aleppo Codex, and it's about the strange journey of the most important copy of the Bible in Hebrew from Aleppo, Syria to Israel. It's kind of a dirty story about uh, theft and um, uh, all kinds of subterfuge. Uh, That was the first book. The second book is called Pumpkin Flowers, and it's about, it's a military memoir about time I spent in the army in South Lebanon in, uh, in the 1990s, and it's about one outpost called Outpost Pumpkin, which played a role in this strange guerrilla conflict with Hezbollah that I kind of blundered into as a Canadian teenager moving here in the 90s. That's Pumpkin Flowers. So those are the two uh, two previous books before this one. So Canadian teenager moving here. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Like what got you to where you are today? Is this something that you planned or you just kind of found yourself doing what it is you're doing, which by the way, I could relate to tremendously if the latter is the answer. I think I always thought of journalism as a career even before I really knew what that was. I started out at a magazine called the Jerusalem Report, which used to be a great magazine uh, back in the day. And I was an intern there in 1997, right before I went into the army and uh, spent, I did my military service and then went to university, studied Islamic studies and started working for the report full time after that. And then moved to the AP, the American News Agency for a while. And, um, became kind of disillusioned with that and um, um, then started to write books. So I've been lucky to be able to do this for as long as I have. I've been doing this for 20 years. I've been able to pursue my own interests rather than kind of writing what other people want me to write, which is what you end up doing as a journalist a lot of the time. So, yeah, so I'm very lucky to have been. So if you mentioned the AP, so you put out a tremendous, it was on YouTube, where would people find it? Talking about what it's like to work for them and how people have to be a little bit careful or a lot careful with some of the messages coming out about Israel. Where would people find that? that? Uh, I wrote two essays in the summer of 2014, right at the end of the uh, war with Gaza that we had that summer. Uh, The the essays were a critique of the way uh, many international media outlets cover Israel, not just AP. It was through the lens of my experience at the AP, which is the world's biggest news organization, but it's about it's about a more general problem with the way Israel's described. So if you uh, are looking for those essays, you can find them on my on my website, which is just my name, www.matifriedman.com. Uh, one was in the Atlantic magazine and one was in Tablet, and they kind of sketched the contours of this problem in the way that Israel is uh, is described. The essays got a lot of attention at that time, and they're still probably brought up more than anything else that I've ever written. Mm-hmm. No, they were very influential, I know, for, for me and for other people who uh, who read them as well, or like I said, saw the YouTube. So were you raised a Zionist household in Canada? Is not known as like a bastion, I guess, of ideology either way. Where exactly in Canada? I grew up in Toronto, and I grew up in a home that didn't have a lot of ideology, but we... Uh, we came to Israel a few times when I was a kid, and my parents were always very um, eager for us to know the country, and not and not through ideology, but to actually just love the actual country. And we spent uh, two, we had two long visits here when I was eleven, and then thirteen, and then I came back on a summer program when I was seventeen, and um, and then I finished high school and came here, and I've stayed, uh, and I've been here ever since. But to come, now it's kind of a thing to be a lone soldier, or at least you hear about it more. But when you came, that that was pretty big, an unusual step to take. Uh, luckily, my parents also ended up in Israel and they came a week before I went into the army. So I wasn't a lone soldier. I had parents in the country, which was lucky. Um, and, they, and my parents have also been here ever since. So the, the family ended up uh, ended up here. I've been here since 1995, my parents since 1997. Mm-hmm. So it's a long time already. I don't want to think about how long it, that is exactly, <laughs> but it's uh, yeah, two or three years, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. I was just in Toronto a couple of weeks ago, and um, it was snowing, and apparently it's still snowing. So it just you made a good move in terms of that. So do you, when you finish a book, do you already have your next book in your head? How does it work? Not not always. I Sometimes I have two things going at the same time. I started work on Spies of No Country before I wrote my second book, um, and then kind of set this one aside and went back to it, and I kind of seemed to... 
I work slowly. It takes me a while to figure out exactly what the story is. Pumpkin Flowers, my second book, came out in, um, I guess, 2016, but I started writing it in 2001. And then I set it aside and went back to it and threw it out and came back to it. And uh, so that um, I don't work in a particularly uh, meth methodical uh, mm -hmm. way about this. I do have a few ideas for the next project, but I'm not exactly sure which one of them is going to come to fruition yet. Mm -hmm. Is it just writing or are you involved in other things like, uh, you know, script writing or, or other things like that? Right now I'm working on a documentary TV series for Israeli public television, which is about this war in the 90s in South Lebanon, which uh, is not very well known, not just outside Israel, but in Israel as well. So this is a series in Hebrew, three episodes that looks at this war that people never admitted was a war. Uh, so I'm busy with that at the moment. But, uh, but writing is my, uh, my main pursuit. And, uh, and the books, of course, I write for the, for the New York Times op-ed page um, once in a while and yeah, so that's what I love to do. Do you write in Hebrew and in English, or you write in English and it's translated, or the other way around? I write in English and it's translated. I've been involved with the Hebrew translations of the books, but um, I've been involved as an editor, not as the translator. Because mm -hmm. it, it's very different. Uh, in Hebrew is much poorer in numbers of words, not a whole lot of adjectives and adverbs in Hebrew, and which is what your books are very full of. So do you find that like the Hebrew translation that's coming out is um well like i remember talking to yossi klein halevi when his when his book was coming out in hebrew and he was telling me that it's a, it's almost a different book and the, the core of it's the same but you're writing for a different audience it's not just language language is culture so there are actually some things that he did have to change do you find that the same thing with your book or it's just more of as straight a translation as you could possibly get no it's a totally different uh different project because these books are about israel they can't just be translated into Hebrew. They have to be kind of tweaked for, for the audience. Although I have found in the case of the two books that have already been translated, this one will be translated. It is being translated. It'll be out in about six months. But because I tend to write about obscure topics that are not known even to Israelis, they don't need major work because in the case of you know the Arab section, most Israelis have never heard of it. So it's mm -hmm. not like we have to uh, assume a lot of knowledge about about this, the topic and the same thing with pumpkin flowers and the same thing with the Aleppo Codex. So they've had to be tweaked. The language has to be right. The tone of the book has to be right. But in terms of the subject, these topics are as, in many ways almost as new to Israelis as they are to an American audience. Mm -hmm. So you, don't have, so you would still, whatever background you would have to fill in for the English-speaking audience, you still have to fill in for the Hebrew-speaking audience. How about Arabic? Has any, do you think if someone might approach you, especially this book, would, might someone approach you to translate into Arabic? Well, that would be my, my dream. Um, I would love to see it out in Arabic. Um, for Arab for, uh, publishers in the Arabic uh, language, it's very tricky to publish Israeli books, and that happens on occasion, but, uh, but it's tricky. And there isn't much, unfortunately, there isn't much of a book market in the Arab world. Um, so none of these books have been translated into Arabic. Uh, whether this one will, um, unfortunately, I, I, I doubt it. Although if anyone's listening to this podcast and owns a publishing company in Arabic, <laughs> um, I'd, I'd send me an email. Okay. That's a sad comment on the Arab world, that there's not much of a demand for books there um, in general. I mean, that's something that we've known for a long time. Um, and Israel, we've got Book Week here. I mean, people are always reading constantly. I think this says a lot about our culture as well that we are constantly I'm with people of the book. So I guess it totally makes sense. When you consider the size of the Arab world, we're talking about 330 million people. Uh, the size of the book market is not uh, not what we'd expect. Yeah, which is too bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, maybe they've got their changes to make, like we've got our changes to make. And, uh, and hopefully everybody can do it, again, from a place of self-confidence, of not wanting to hurt anybody else, but be able to look in the mirror and say, this is where we are right now. Did some really horrific things to get here. Did some marvelous things to get here. Uh, and where do we go from here? And I think that that's very indicative of Israel today. I would hope that maybe we can influence our neighbors on that level, but who knows? Um, but really great book, Spies of No Country, Secret Lives at the Birth of Israel. Where can people get this? Of course, Amazon, like you can do everything in this world. Yes, exactly. But better <laughs> not, better not. Your local bookstore probably has it. Um, if you have no other choice, you can certainly order it on, on Amazon. And if you want more information about it, you can check my website or any of the social media platforms that I'm on, like Twitter and Facebook. Okay. Well, so when I contacted you about a month ago for the interview, you were also in the States. Uh, you've been, so you've been going on book tours, particularly for this book, or just in general talking about what you do? 
yeah, when a book comes out, I do a few kind of uh, tours in the United States. Um, I'm going back again in the first two weeks of May. I'll be in Kansas City and in Detroit. I'll be in New York for a couple of days, in Toronto and in Montreal. You have any open dates if anyone's listening and figures you're already there, maybe they'll bring you in? Um, unfortunately not. It's all it's all booked. And if um, if you want to know more details, um, check my website or follow me on, on Twitter. Mm-hmm. I, I'll be publishing the precise dates soon. Okay. But I would, you know, there's a bigger English speaking world outside of North America. So if anybody's listening from Australia or from England or from anywhere where people understand English, which is most places, uh, that might be a really great thing. Because I also think that you bring a very interesting perspective of Israeli society. You can most definitely not be labeled, and which is what I very much enjoy. And, uh, and I think that anybody who really has a chance to hear you in person or even through your books will definitely get a valuable insight into some of what has gone on here in the past and also what we're dealing with today. Yeah, I think that, um, well, thank you. <laughs> I think that too often what gets written from here is very ideal, ideological in its motivation, whether it's you know very negative about Israel or very positive about Israel, but it's a complicated place. And um, I think if you're, you know, kind of tr- trying to understand it carefully, there's going to be an audience for that. Uh, mm-hmm. And people are kind of happy to encounter something that's not propaganda. That's kind of an honest attempt to figure things out. I think that's more important these days than ever when a lot of people just want to sit in an echo chamber and do not want to be challenged at all to maybe rethink some of their beliefs or realizing that it's okay for someone to think differently than they do or it's okay to even change their mind. Oh, my God. Uh, And I think that that's hugely important, especially in these days with so much of the polarization and so much of just people just not even want to hear anything from anybody else. Specifically in the United States, England's not a whole lot better, maybe even worse. And so this is it's very important that voices like yours keep getting out there and challenging people to rethink and to say, this was bad, but it's okay, or it's not okay, and let's not do it again. This was great, let's try and do it again. Hugely important voice, I think, Monty Friedman, and I hope that more people get a chance to read you and to meet you. Thank you very much for having me on the show. It is my pleasure. All right, everybody. Um, the website will be down in the text so that you can get in touch with Monty Friedman on your own. Um, I am also going to be in the States at the very beginning of May in the New York area. Still have a couple dates open. I'm going for, um, for Mizrahi. They have a big Shabbat before Independence Day. So I'm going to be speaking at a synagogue in Long Island, but I'll also be in Manhattan and kind of bouncing around that general area and do have a couple of dates open. So, You can be in touch with me if that interests you. Uh, Thanks to Ben and to Tabitha and everybody at the station. And thank all of you for listening. And so uh, that's it. Eve Harrow Rejuvenation. I hope you enjoyed the show. I hope you have a meaningful beginning of Passover. We'll be here in the the middle. And take care, everybody. Bye for now. Experience the best kept secret in the land of Israel, the Arugot Farms and Retreat Center, headquarters of the Land of Israel Network. Join Arya Bromlitz and Jeremy Gimpel, May 6, 2019, to encounter the Judean frontier. Our Passover visit is already sold out. For more information, email tours at thelandofisrael.com. That's tours at thelandofisrael.com.